This may be one of the only times that somebody has gone missing in the American Southwest and aliens have not once been blamed. I'm Aiden Mattis and welcome back to The Lore Lodge. In the year 1980, 41-year-old Paul Fugit was working as a naturalist and ranger at the Chiricahua National Monument in southeastern Arizona, United States. Paul was trained as biologist, having earned his undergraduate degree in the field from the Arlington State College, now the University of Texas at Arlington. After he finished up there in the 1960s, he floated around with odd jobs for a minute before eventually landing one with the National Park Service. Alongside his duties as a naturalist, Paul performed most of the average National Park Service ranger jobs. So that meant that he was walking trails, he was leading tours, doing things of that nature. And of course, this kind of job required that he had an intimate understanding of all 17 of the park's curated trails. And during his time with the National Park Service, which began in the late 1960s, Paul never really had a smooth job. It's, it wasn't that he was, you know, the golden boy. He actually was fired in 1971 and had to sue to get his job back. During that time, Ed Morgan, a civil rights lawyer not related to the Morgan & Morgan that we've done ads for, Ed Morgan was leading this case, he was fighting to get Paul his job back, but as he did that, and again, this took five years, Paul had to go and get other jobs, he had to look into other career possibilities, and he did that by going and studying in Tucson to get a degree in botany, a master's degree in botany. And the thing is, he was crushing it while he was there. The people that he worked under and with said that he was one of the brightest minds they'd ever had in the field, and they could see him being a very, very good professor if he stuck with that route. However, Paul wasn't really a button-down type of guy, he wasn't a 9-to-5 type of guy, so when eventually the National Park Service was forced through the lawsuit to give him his job back, he returned right back to that field. When he did that, he took up residence at Chiricahua National Monument, and he did so in a small cabin on the monument's grounds, while his wife Dodie lived two hours away in Tucson working as a science photographer. Obviously, marriages that are long-distance relationships are not really the easiest thing to deal with, but he would drive to see Dodie every other weekend and spend a couple of days there admiring her work and talking to her about events and everything before returning to his home on the monument grounds. And when he was on the monument grounds, when he was working, he spent a lot of time on the park's trails. So the afternoon of January 13th, 1980, was no different from Paul's normal schedule. On that day, which is deep in the off-season, so there was only one other person working the visitor center with him, he told that aide that he was just going to go hike a trail, and if he wasn't back by 4.30pm, just lock up without him because, you know, it wasn't a big deal. Because he worked at and lived on the monument's property, he knew all of these trails like the back of his hand, and that's why nobody was really concerned when, at 4.30pm, Paul was not back. When Paul did not return home that evening, however, one of the most complicated mysteries in Park Service history was born, and it's one that, to this day, still lacks a concrete answer. And speaking of things that are mysterious, have you ever wondered how all of those big data brokers get all of your information and put it up on websites so people can just search your name and figure out, you know, where you live, what your phone number is, when you were born, who you're married to, all of that? And more importantly, have you ever wondered how it is that you can get rid of that information on all of those sites? Well, we actually do have a solution for you, and it is our partner for this video, Delete Me. Have you ever entered your address, your email, your name, your phone number, things like that into an online form somewhere? Because if you have, chances are, if you weren't charged for whatever you were entering the information for, well, unfortunately, if there's no price, you're the product. What that means is that hundreds of websites all over the internet are compiling your data, putting it in one place, and then selling it to the highest bidder. I can speak personally on this, I used to work in marketing and advertising, and I can tell you that a lot of our leads that I ended up handing to the salespeople did not come from those leads telling us they wanted, no, oh, I don't know, health insurance. It came from people looking something up, entering some information onto a form, and then that being crawled and sold to other people. And the thing is, while subconsciously you might be aware, and in the fine print it might be legal, usually your conscious mind isn't thinking, mm, I shouldn't put this information in because somebody else might get it. And the average person might not be super concerned about it until you really think about what's going on. And for a person like me, the idea that somebody can simply pay for a little subscription somewhere and then get all of my personal information is a little terrifying. When you're a public figure, you start to worry about what people might do. But it's not just people like me who have to worry about somebody crazy coming and breaking down their door. It could be that somebody goes online and finds out who your cell service provider is, 
or your direct address. Or more importantly, they might do something like what's been going on in Pennsylvania recently, where they say, hey, we're from Energy Company and we need you to pay up right now. And we know your address, we know how long you've been there, all the information that might make them seem legit, but in reality, it's just some scammers. So, as somebody who not only is, you know, in that public figure position, but also has had family members be scammed by people who just knew a little bit too much, I recommend Delete Me as the best way to get rid of all of that extraneous information out there on the internet. The great thing about Delete Me is that it is a hands-free subscription-based software that allows you to input your information and then they have their team of experts go in and request removals from all of the data broker sites. And what's really so great about Delete Me is the way that they make everything so transparent for you. You can get a privacy report in just seven days, which tells you how many places your data showed up. And from there, you can request that all of your personal information, phone, email, address, first name, last name, all of that is removed. And from there, Delete Me's team will monitor all of these sites and repeat these removals as needed. And if you found yourself somewhere that maybe Delete Me didn't catch it, you can even go in and make a custom removal request so that you don't have to handle the nonsense, frankly, that is going and requesting that your data be removed. They will make you jump through so many hoops to get it done yourself, whereas the Delete Me team, they can just get it done for you. And that all stems from Delete Me's very simple mission. Your data is private and it should not be available for purchase online. They believe that you have the right to own, manage, and remove your personal information from the internet at will. And since the ways that companies collect, share, and sell your data are constantly changing, they strongly believe that online privacy solutions must continuously change to keep up. If you'd like to join me in giving Delete Me a try and making yourself a much more private person, then you can use our code LoreLodge to get 20% off of your subscription. You can also go to joindeleteme.com slash lorelodge to get the same deal. And with all of that said, I really do have to say this is the perfect partner for this video because one of the theories here is that our friend Paul Fugit just decided to delete himself from existence in the sense that he was starting over anew. But due to all of the just straight up odd circumstances surrounding this, nobody's really sure if Paul walked off on his own or if somebody made sure he never made it back to the visitor center that night. And of course, central to the story of Paul's disappearance and whatever may have happened to him after that is Chiricahua National Monument, which sits just west of the New Mexico and Arizona border and less than 30 miles away from the Mexico-Arizona border. It's also just southeast of the San Carlo Apache Reservation, and it is for a group of Apache Native Americans that Chiricahua is named. I'll take this opportunity to tell you that if you are new to Lore Lodge content, we will often have a short regional history section at the beginning of our videos, usually ranging from 5 to 15 minutes, and that's what we're about to get into right now. Specifically, we're going to be talking about the Apache. If that is not something that you're interested in, however, and you'd like to get straight into the story of Paul Fugit, you can just skip to the next chapter of this video. But as I said, the monument is named for the Chiricahua Apache people, and this is a, a member group of the Dene-speaking peoples. Those Dene-speaking peoples include groups up in Canada, who are widely known as the Athabascan populations, and then a group in the Pacific Northwest, and finally, the Southwestern Dene, the Southern Dene, who are the Navajo and the Apache primarily. However, the Chiricahua called themselves Nende, just meaning the people. And the Chiricahua were not always one band of Native Americans, specifically the Apache. They were several different groups who eventually coalesced to form this specific band. And I'll get into how bands and tribes and all of that differ in a moment. But this coalition included groups that were specifically the Chaconan, the Chehene, and the Nednai. Altogether, these have been called both the Chiricahua and the Central Apache. The Apache overall are generally believed to have come from the north, migrating into the American Four Corners region sometime between 1000 and 1500 AD. Of course, they would have come from Canada. This has led some to believe that they, along with the Navajo, are the descendants of this mysterious disappearing tribe from the Hani River Valley, and that tribe was known to the northern Dene as the Naha. Now, while it's believed that they did come down with the same group of people who would eventually form into the Navajo, nobody's really sure how or why the Apache and the Navajo separated. That's not to say that there aren't theories, however, and many believe that it could have been a simple lifestyle difference. The Navajo adopted agriculture as one of their primary sources of food, while the Apache maintained more of a hunter-gatherer nomadic lifestyle, with some groups preferring small-scale agriculture. It's possible that this split between the Navajo and the Dene, then, stems from the fact that one group put down roots and started doing agriculture, while the other preferred to remain nomadic. 
Over time, this would lead to the development of two separate cultures, and of course, then two separate people groups. Some Apache did settle down to an extent, while others remained purely nomadic. And this was reported by the Spanish explorer Francisco Coronado in 1541. He described them as wholly nomadic, using sleds pulled by dogs to transport their belongings, much as their northern ancestors would have. He also reported that they would follow herds of bison, and that when they would kill one, they would actually eat it raw, and in the absence of drinkable water, they would drink bison blood, which is not out of the ordinary for nomadic tribes across the world. We've also seen, uh, we, we've heard that both the Mongols and the Huns would do this as well. Considering both of those groups came from Siberia, and it's generally thought that Native Americans also migrated from Siberia, all of this makes sense. That said, it's entirely possible that Coronado was exaggerating to some extent. And as I said, certain Apache groups were more nomadic than others were. And the Chiricahua were distinct from the rest of the Apache in a number of ways. One of those was their kinship system. There were two primary kinship systems amongst the Apache, one of which was the Chiricahua, the other was the Hikaria. But as far as the Chiricahua went, the most basic structural unit outside of the immediate family for them was the extended family. And what you would typically see is that all of this was matrilocal. That meant that the women were the center of the living unit. Men would leave their family home and go to live with their wife's family. So over time, all of the women in one family would remain in one place while they were constantly bringing in new men from other clans and groups. And when it was necessary or beneficial, these extended family units would often form into groups. So you'd have a, a number of different families who all lived in the same general area who might bind together for shared defense, hunting, anything like that. And these groups were typically led by a chief, but that position was not hereditary as we see with certain tribes, for example, the, na the Naches. In this case, the position of chief was entirely meritocratic and it wasn't even necessarily declared. You would see that people just kind of followed the people they believed were worthy of being followed. When the case would arise that you might need an even higher level of organization, you might need even more people for something, for example, a war, well, that's when you might see a band form, and a band was made up of a bunch of groups who would then usually elect a chief amongst them. This is why the Chiricahua, the Hikaria, those groups would be referred to as bands. Going back to the extended family units briefly, however, they were, they were structured differently from how we understand extended family today. The way that we conceive of family relationships today, you have two parents and then their children, and those children are siblings. And then the parents, their siblings, are aunts and uncles, and their children are cousins of the initial family we're talking about here. The Chiricahua, however, made no distinction between sibling and cousin. If you were from the same generation and your parents were siblings, you referred to each other as the a, a, a sibling or a family member of the opposite sex or the same sex. It wasn't brother, sister, cousin, things like that. It was family member of opposite sex, family member of same sex. And this carried over to another practice that they had, which was the avoidance of the relatives of the opposite sex of your wife. And what I mean by that is that when you when a man married into a family, the only female member of that family that he was allowed to acknowledge was his wife. The man would avoid in any way being connected to, interacting with the female relatives of his wife, and those same female relatives would be expected to do the same. They would avoid the man. However, if one spouse died or was infertile, then it was expected that the surviving spouse would procreate with a sibling or cousin of the deceased. When Europeans first made contact with the Apache, there were six main bands or loosely organized tribes. These were the Chiricahua and the Hikaria, as well as the Lipan, the Mescalero, the Plains, and Western Apache. And like I said, the term tribe is extremely loose here. These were basically just groups of bands. There was no tribal organizational structure. Bands and groups within any of these six given tribes would be entirely autonomous and really only recognized tribe as a shared heritage and culture. The Chiricahua were also distinct in their religious beliefs, sharing a lot less with their Navajo cousins than most of the other Apache groups. While the Navajo and the majority of Apache have a creation story that tells how human beings came to exist in the first place, the Chiricahua story starts with the birth of two culture heroes who then go on to slay monsters and save the human race. And it was also the Chiricahua who put up some of the fiercest resistance to Spanish, Mexican, and American encroachment into their territory. This began with Spanish incursions into the region that were purely exploratory. For example, Coronado was looking for the lost city of Cibola, the city of gold. 
but this would be followed then by missionary and trade efforts and finally full-scale colonization efforts in the 17th and 18th centuries. This led to a number of clashes between Spanish settlers and Apache bands, and the Spanish answer to this was to build a series of fortified towns all over the territory they had claimed. This was a very similar defensive strategy to that used by Alfred the Great of Wessex way back during the Viking era. Early on in the settlement period, when there were conflicts between settlers and the Apache, the Spanish would take anybody they captured and send them to Cuba as slaves. However, Apache and Pueblo, who would convert to Christianity, would often side with the Spanish or see uh, better treatment during these conflicts. Most importantly, they were also occupants of these forts. The result of this aggressive approach of taking captured Apache and sending them away as slaves, setting up these various fortified settlements, and the end of hostilities with the Comanche peoples to the east would all lead to basically the end of Apache raids against the Spanish by 1793. And by this point, there were thousands of Apache living around and in these settlements anyway. So for a time, it looked like there would actually be peace and harmony and cohabitation between Apache and Spaniard. Unfortunately for the Apache, in 1821, Mexico gained its independence, and then they proceeded to do some stuff that usually only America and Canada get in trouble for. You see, Mexico didn't really like the Spanish practice of providing food and goods to the Apache living around the settlements and treating them as, you know, people. So with Mexico no longer providing what was needed to the people living in their territory, the Chiricahua and the Mescaleros specifically were both sort of forced to go back to their nomadic ways, and that meant not just hunting and gathering, but also going back to raiding. The Mexicans responded with increased military presence at the forts, as well as bounties placed on Apache men over the age of 14. There were also smaller bounties for women and children. And when I say bounties on them, I don't just mean bounties as in bringing the person in for questioning or imprisonment. I mean scalps. They were, if you brought them a scalp, you were paid 100 pesos. It was then 50 for adult females and 25 for children. And back then, bringing in a single adult male Apache scalp would bring you more money than most Mexicans were making in a year. And you'd also get to keep any captured property. So as you can imagine, this led to people just going and finding Apaches and murdering them. So it was no surprise that when the United States went to war with Mexico in 1846, the Apache largely sided with the United States. And at this point, the Apache didn't have a ton of familiarity with Anglo-Americans. Most Americans who were moving into Mexican territory were doing so via the Oregon Trail and the California Trail. But during and then after the war, they would become very familiar with the United States of America. Part of that is because after the Mexican-American War and the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, which is still one of my favorite names for a treaty ever, but after that, it was us, the Americans, who were treaty-bound to make sure the Apache stopped raiding into Mexico, which, as you can imagine, led to conflict between the Americans and the Apache. This series of conflicts was known as the Apache Wars, and for the Chiricahua, that kicked off in 1861. In that year, Apache raiders targeted a rancher by the name of John Ward and kidnapped his stepson during their raid. Because the only people in the area who possibly could have stood up to the Apache were the U.S. Army, that's who he went to. Lieutenant George Bascom was dispatched, and he believed that it was a specific Apache leader by the name of Cochise who had been the one who kidnapped this boy. In order to arrest him, he invited him to come and speak, didn't tell Cochise what, what was going on, but he invited him to come and have a little bit of a discussion, a meeting, and then tried to arrest Cochise and his family. Cochise, of course, managed to escape and then took a hostage before running off into the hills. But because Cochise was not the only person who had been arrested, also many of his family members had, he couldn't just let it go. He didn't just need to escape on his own. So what they did was raid some more trade caravans and settler caravans and take more hostages. In one case, it's said that he ritualistically murdered about 11, I want to say, 11 Mexicans, and then kept the Americans as actual hostages because the U.S. Army wasn't really going to care about the Mexican hostages at all. How truthful that account is, I am not certain, but that's, that's how the story goes. Thing is, the Americans wouldn't budge about the hostages, and in the end, both sides ended up killing all of the hostages. Cochise then went on to lead raiding parties against American settlements and trade caravans all over the Southwest for over a decade, and during that time period, the United States military, as well as for a little bit the Confederate States military, couldn't really do anything about it because they were so preoccupied fighting each other. After the Civil War, the Union military was still dealing with Reconstruction and couldn't devote quite enough resources to go chasing a guy all over the Southwest. However, the lack of ability to send a full army to go find Cochise wasn't quite as much of a problem as it was for the Mexicans, because while the Mexicans had sort of put this blanket bounty out on all of the Apache, 
The Americans were smarter, and they were willing to use the Apache who were willing to fight with them as scouts. You have to remember, the Apache didn't really see themselves as a singular nation. They were a group of bands formed into loosely correlated tribes who often fought each other. If you look back to the way that Rome handled the invasion of Gaul, that's much the way that the United States handled the Southwest. Much as Julius Caesar used the divide and conquer strategy to take Gaul, the Americans did the same thing in the Southwest. Cochise would eventually surrender in 1872, and then he would go and spend the rest of his days on the Chiricahua Reservation, which now does not exist, until 1874. But even though Cochise had retired and put down his rifle and set it aside and been done with all of it, one amongst his number was not quite ready to give up, and it's a name that you've probably heard before, the Native American warrior Geronimo. Geronimo had been a subordinate and a medicine man to the Apache war chief Cochise. Shortly after the death of Cochise, the Chiricahua Reservation was closed, and all of its inhabitants ordered to move to the San Carlos Reservation. Geronimo did not really like that idea, so instead he and his followers went south across the border into Mexico. He would be something of a troublemaker for the U.S. military until 1886 when he was finally captured after the United States deployed over 5,000 soldiers to capture him. Why is that number kind of absurd? It's because Geronimo at this point had only 24 men with him. We deployed over 5,000 soldiers, 100 Apache scouts, and thousands more volunteers to capture 25 guys. And we struggled with it. In fact, it's pretty likely that without the aid of other Apache, we might not have ever got the guy. But even with the capture of Geronimo, that wasn't the end of Apache raids. In fact, the Apache would be the last Native American tribe to consistently use militaristic tactics to fight against the Americans when they were finally defeated in 1924. Today, the Chiricahua National Monument is named in honor of this warrior culture, as well as the multiple Apache to earn the U.S. Medal of Honor. Now, how much of that Paul Fugit actually knew or cared about is not something that I know, but what I do know is that he loved Chiricahua. Or at least he, he loved what he did at Chiricahua. He had a deep reverence for nature and the land that he was on, if not for the organization that was running it. And from a young age, Paul had always been very interested in nature, according to Brandon Burrell, who wrote an absolutely phenomenal article in Outside that we used heavily for this video. I will put a link to it in the description. It is very well written, it is compelling, and I think, I, I just think Brandon did a great job as an investigator, and I, I would like for that to be a, a, something I say. I want that to be very clear. I am seriously impressed with the work this guy did. This video would be nowhere near as detailed or as long without his work. Paul had been born in Brooklyn, but his family moved to Fort Worth at the outset of World War II. And it was there, as a teenager, that Paul developed this love of nature, but also his rebellious streak, as his father was a hard-driving, strict metal worker. As a teen, Paul kind of chafed against the strict rules that his hard-driving metal worker father had given him, and as a result, this developed into a bit of a rebellious streak as an adult, which, in turn, caused Paul to struggle in holding down a career. As I said at the beginning of the video, he worked some odd jobs, tried a few different things out, but in 1965, he found his footing with the National Park Service. And in that year, he was stationed at Carlsbad Caverns, where he moved with his newlywed wife, Dodie Fugit. The pair had met when they were both in college in 1962, and Dodie had been a friend of Paul's sisters, specifically his younger sister, Monette. According to Burrell's article, the first interaction that Dodie and Paul had was when Paul explained some stuff about the Inuit to her and then asked if she wanted to see his gun collection. Now, while Dodie was a huge fan of Paul's interests and his demeanor and just the way that he was as a guy, the National Park Service was not, and he started to encounter problems with the way he presented himself when he arrived at his second assignment, which was the Navajo National Monument in northeastern Arizona. Here, Park Superintendent Jack Williams took issue with the way that Paul dressed and wore his hair and did basically anything at all, this being because he was an old-fashioned sort of man who couldn't understand the new breed of agents coming into the National Park Service. Paul, on the other hand, thought that all of Jack Williams' uh, obsession with things like dress code and being on time were sort of silly and unnecessary. Paul and Jack repeatedly fought over basically everything, until eventually Paul was reassigned to Chiricahua in 1970. Jack Williams had wanted to fire the man, but he lacked standing to do so. Paul either learned nothing from this experience or deliberately chose to buck the standards yet again when he started to wear a Fu Manchu mustache that the National Park Service absolutely did not like, and in 1971, he was fired for negative personal attitude and abuse of park property. 
I had the second charge wrong. It was abuse of government equipment, and the allegation was that he had stolen hay to feed Dodie's horse. He said this didn't happen. Under normal circumstances, if this were just any old National Park Service ranger who got accused of abuse of government equipment and it was alleged that they stole hay for a horse they owned, I wouldn't really think much of it. I'd be like, yeah, that sounds reasonable. But in this case, it really sounds like they were just looking for something to get Paul on that wasn't your hair is bad. Paul sued, and during the course of the next five years, he moved back to Tucson and studied botany in grad school. However, when he won his case in 1976 and was reinstated at Chiricahua to the happiness of nobody involved, he stayed there until January 13th, 1980. Around 2, 2.30 p.m. that day, he informed the only other person working on the park that afternoon, an aide of his that he'd be going to do a trail, and that he should be back sometime that evening, and if he wasn't back by 4.30 p.m., no big deal. Familiarity with the trails was part of his job, so this struck nobody as particularly odd. However, he did not tell anybody particularly which trail he'd be going on, so there were 17 for him to choose from. If he were to be going directly from the visitor center and taking no roads, then there are three trails that he could have possibly taken, all of which head east and all of which take two to four hours to complete. A short ways north of the visitor center, up Scenic Drive, is the Bonita Canyon Campground, which serves as the trailhead for the Silver Springs or Silver Spur Trail. That leads to Faraway Ranch, which takes an hour to an hour and a half to complete there and back. Next closest is the Natural Bridge Trail, which is about 1.25 miles up the road and takes two and a half hours to complete. Essentially, every other trail on the property required driving to get there, and it does not appear that Paul left in his car. In any case, Paul's colleagues thought nothing of it until his boss, Ted Scott, received a phone call around 8 p.m. that evening informing him that Paul had not returned home. Now this is where things start to get complicated, because as you may remember, Dodie lived two hours away in Tucson, while Paul lived in a small stone cabin on the monument grounds. The person who reported Paul missing was a seasonal employee, referred to by Burrell as Bonnie, who was living with Paul in the cabin, or at least staying with Paul in the cabin. As it turned out, Paul's appearance was not the only thing about him that was non-traditional. He and Dodie had an open marriage with the stipulation that any extraneous extramarital relationships be purely physical in nature. He was not allowed to develop an emotional connection to anybody he was seeing. And Dodie did in fact know about Bonnie, and the two had even met. Just the prior week, when Bonnie had flown into Tucson to see Paul and go to stay with him at the campground, both Paul and Dodie had picked her up from the airport. It also may be relevant to note that Bonnie was 20 years Paul's junior, and the two had met in, and began dating in 1978. If we're doing the math here, Bonnie would have been 21 when Paul went missing, and she would have been 19 when they started seeing each other. The, the 70s and 80s were just a different time, it seems. With all of that out there, it was, of course, Bonnie who called in the fact that he wasn't home. So, the night of January 13th, 1980, saw Ted Scott and some other rangers in the area coming onto the property and searching as many trails as they could get to, calling out Paul's name. But they found no sign of him, and he never responded when they called for him. In the morning, they called the sheriff to report the disappearance and took stock of the situation. As it turned out, Paul had left at 2 p.m. and had not taken his ID, money, radio, or even his pocket magnifying glass, nor had he specified which trail he would be on to anyone at all. It wasn't much, but the good news was that two dozen people could easily search the entirety of the park's trail system in just one day, and that's exactly what the Cochise County Sheriff's Department did. However, the 22 people and a dog team who spent Monday the 14th searching all over the park for Paul found nothing. So they appealed for more help, and the next day, Tuesday the 15th, the Arizona National Guard sent a helicopter, and the Southern Arizona Rescue Association sent 16 of their own searchers. Even with the addition of over a dozen new searchers checking every nook and cranny within half a mile of the visitor center, while the rangers patrolled all of the trails, not a thing could be found. Absolutely nothing turned up to progress the search effort. Then, on Thursday the 17th, Dodie and a friend of hers arrived with two horses to join in the search for her husband, which was now hampered by a pretty heavy snowfall. While there, she and Bonnie met in Paul's cabin and spoke about not just the missing person situation, but also her relationship with Paul, because as it turned out, Dodie and Paul had picked her up from the airport together as a way of saying, hey, Dodie's become a little too uncomfortable with the level of emotional connection in this relationship, and this is going to be the last time you two see each other at least in this context. Meanwhile, Dodie was unaware of something that was going on with Bonnie that was even more problematic, because as it turned out, Bonnie was pregnant. This surprised both of them, as Paul had told Bonnie that he'd had a vasectomy, and Dodie was unaware of any vasectomy. 
At this point, Bonnie was only suspicious of her pregnancy. She had missed two months of her period. And so at, at Dodie's urging, she left the monument, went to Tucson, got a pregnancy test, and then terminated at two months. Unfortunately, even as the search progressed for a full two weeks, Paul simply could not be located. Although little hints and clues were popping up here and there. About five days into the hunt, a parks worker by the name of Dick Horton came forward saying that he believed he may have seen Paul on the day he disappeared. He told investigators that he'd seen Paul in the front seat of a pickup truck between two other men as it sped away from the property at about 50 miles per hour. As his story went, he turned to his wife and said, there goes Paul Fugit. At this point, the lead detective on the case, Cochise County Detective Craig Emanuel, decided that he was going to take Dick and put him under hypnosis so they could try and dig out a little bit more. Horton, through tears and clearly very upset at the whole situation, relayed to Craig Emanuel that the pickup truck had been a green color with a camping shell and that one of the men was wearing black, red, and white flannel and that uh, the other one was wearing a green jacket similar to that a National Park Service employee would wear. He also said that the driver of the vehicle, the man in plaid, looked to be about in his 30s with a Kenny Loggins beard. Additionally, others had reported that they had seen tire tracks, possibly spin-out tracks, near the faraway ranch as well as signs of a struggle in the dirt. That immediately made Faraway Ranch, just 5,000 feet and a half an hour walk from the visitor center, the primary location for the search. The ranch was a recent addition to the monument, donated just three years earlier when the last owner died. Now that they had a likely last known location for Paul, Doty brought in a psychic, which was far, far more common in the 1980s and taken a lot more seriously than it is now. Once there, the clairvoyant told her of a vision she said that she saw Paul through a time portal as he encountered two men bent over an unconscious woman. The men saw Paul, forced some sort of substance down his throat, and then took his body to Mexico. The problem was that even if the psychic was completely correct about what had happened, and if Dick Horton's story was true, they still had no way of tracing where Paul had gone next. The only information they had was two men and a green pickup truck. So phase two of the investigation became even more complicated because two very distinct theories began to emerge. According to Burrell's article, National Park Service detective Pat Hanley believed that Paul had simply run away from a failed career, a broken marriage, and a pregnant girlfriend. Paul did have a less than stellar record as a parks employee, a husband, and a boyfriend, considering that he was known to smoke marijuana on the job, was actively cheating on his wife all the time, and lied about getting a vasectomy. Granted, Dodie was okay with the infidelity as far as she would tell anyone, even going so far as to write that she could not let Bonnie, who is a sweet, nice girl, save face and salve her conscience to the tune of crucifying Paul. Furthermore, she wrote, if Bonnie could see that she has experienced something that has happened to a million women before her, that it was not a singular crime, that she was not defrauded, but simply fooled herself. I, I don't know particularly where that sentence was going, but Bonnie did write it somewhere, and that's all Burrell included. To be honest, I can't blame Burrell for not including the entire transcript of every single thing he learned. When, you, when you're a journalist and you get the exclusive scoop on a story, it's understandable that you might keep some things to yourself. That said, if this video does happen to come across Burrell's desk, I would love to see the documents he has because his article's been out for a while now and it might, it might help. We might be able to point resources in the right direction. But reading through it, fooled herself was likely referring to Paul's lie about the vasectomy. As Bonnie had told Burrell that she loved Paul in a way that would never make him leave his wife. So I don't think that Bonnie had any illusions that Paul was going to leave Dodie for her. And so she wasn't fooling herself in the sense that she thought this relationship was going somewhere. She had just fooled herself by trusting a man 20 years older than her who was cheating on his wife. During the course of Burrell's investigation, he contacted Hanley, I believe in 2019. And Hanley told him, after saying that he was mixed about even speaking to anybody regarding this case because of the way he was treated in the 80s. Uh, anyway, Hanley told him that it was his belief that Paul was likely walking around with a joint in his mouth and a big smile on his face. So that tells you that Hanley thinks that Paul, Paul did all of this on purpose, he intended to disappear, and he is probably somewhere in Cabo. Doty, on the other hand, believed that Paul was most likely dead, citing Dick Horton's story, The Psychic's Vision, and alleged sketchy characters and vandalism that she claimed she had seen around Faraway Ranch. Now, the timeline is a little bit hard to follow, but it appears that Dodie arrived on the 17th. 
Horton gave his story on the 18th, and then she invited psychic Sandy Brooke shortly after Horton's discussion. When precisely Horton was hypnotized by Emmanuel and gave his, his, uh, his version of events is unclear. I should also be clear that we're not talking about the magician kind of hypnosis here. We're talking about forensic hypnosis, which is the kind of thing you'd see on Criminal Minds, where they, they have a psychiatrist, psychologist, sit down with somebody and take them back to that place in order to get some more details from the depths of their memory. It's not really considered the most admissible thing in the world, but it is also not just complete hokum. Meanwhile, Cochise County Sheriff's Office and Detective Craig Emanuel simply wanted to figure out if this was just one random thing that happened or if they had a bigger problem on their hands. Faraway Ranch is only 40 miles from the Mexican border, and Cochise County did have an illegal immigration and growing drug mule problem. However, most of the illegal immigration routes and the drug mule routes were on the eastern side of the monument, not on the western side. So what Emanuel needed to know was, has the problem spread? But at the same time, there were no reports of drug activity or vandalism or sketchy characters around Faraway Ranch. Dodie Fugit was the only person to bring this up to investigators. Nonetheless, Detective Emanuel sided with Dodie in saying that foul play was the most likely option. To that end, two weeks after the disappearance, Dodie approached Ted Scott to ask when she would receive uh, Paul's retirement benefits, to which she was entitled if Paul died on the job. But according to Burrell, Scott thought this was a little premature, as they hadn't decided whether or not Paul was missing or dead yet. Essentially, they believed it was possible that Paul was still alive, even though the official search had been suspended after two weeks. Dodie's reasoning for why she was asking was that she was just preparing for the worst as she didn't make much money. Once again, Craig Emanuel backed her up. Hanley, on the other hand, argued profusely in the opposite direction, stating over and over again that it seemed most likely that Paul had left of his own free will, and therefore Dodie was entitled to nothing. Emanuel was in turn critical of Hanley's beliefs, saying that Hanley didn't really take it seriously, had only stayed on the property for a few days, and that it was most likely a drug deal gone wrong or something like that. However, according to Burrell's investigation, Rangers and park workers and anybody in the area in the 70s and 80s said that the idea that a drug deal gone wrong had occurred at Faraway Ranch was laughable. The whole thing was ludicrous to them. With no clear answer on either side and the National Park Service unwilling to declare him dead, Paul was formally fired after a few weeks of not showing up to work because, you know, he was missing. And because he was not presumed dead, that meant that Dodie did not get survivor's benefits. And they went even further than that, demanding that she pay back the nearly $7,000 in pay that Paul had received in the time that he was missing. This led to a couple of things, one of which was extreme media sympathy for Dodie, who looked like a poor widow being abused by the National Park Service. And, of course, it made the National Park Service look like evil villains for denying a widow her benefits. And, of course, it led to a long legal battle that would not be resolved until 1989. And in order for that legal battle to come to any real conclusion, that meant that they had to figure out what had happened to Paul. And at the very beginning, Craig Emanuel hit things hard, chasing down hundreds of leads. The lead that brought Craig Emanuel closest to solving the case, as far as he was concerned, came from Illinois. In October of 1980, he received a letter from Bloomington telling him to look into a guy by the name of Goff. At the time, Ernest Goff was in jail for grand theft auto, destruction of property, and evading arrest. He, of course, denied any involvement, which led to another letter arriving on Emanuel's desk a year later. This letter implicated a man by the name of Tex Carpenter, who was with Goff when he had been arrested. From what I can tell, Tex's real name was James. Carpenter was also incarcerated, but they brought him in for questioning, at which point he gave them the runaround. For three hours prior to his polygraph test, he basically gave them a series of stories that went all over the place and didn't give them any real information. But he did tell them that he in fact had been present when Goff and an unnamed man shot Paul Fugit, took him, put him into their car, drove him south of Tucson to Santa Cruz County, and dumped him into a wash, which you might know as a gulch. A wash or a gulch is a riverbed that seasonally fills with water. One problem with Carpenter's testimony is that he gave it before the polygraph test. And then when it came time to take the polygraph test, he refused to do it. A couple of weeks later, they managed to convince him to take the polygraph test, at which point he recanted the entire story. Then, a year later, Carpenter would actually claim to know something, but he said he wanted a deal before he informed anybody. And part of the issue was that he was a known enemy of the Aryan Nation. 
or the Aryan Brotherhood, I guess. But, I, I mean, first of all, being a known enemy of the Aryan Brotherhood is probably a good thing. I, I would hope that I'm, I, I, I would hope that I would be considered a known enemy of the Aryan Brotherhood. <laughs> it's one way to know that you're doing something right. The reason I bring that up is that it's, I mean, he might have been willing to say anything to get away from the Aryan Brotherhood. The FBI kind of pegged it as that situation and decided that it wasn't even worth interviewing Goff and Carpenter any further, they just weren't involved. Unfortunately, nobody can ask Goff and Carpenter now because both men have since passed away. That sent Detective Emanuel back to square one, but only briefly, because police in Racine, Wisconsin, gave him a call to tell them that they thought they might have a lead. Somebody that Burrell refers to as David had been heard speaking at a party about how he had done some stuff down in Arizona. The man referred to as David told his friends up in Wisconsin that uh, he had been to the place where Cochise is buried and killed a Border Patrol agent there. Now, Paul was not a Border Patrol agent, but he did wear a badge and a ranger could be mistaken for a Border Patrol agent by somebody stupid enough to murder one. Cochise is said to be buried somewhere in the Dragoon Mountains, 30 miles to the west of Chiricahua, so if Dick Horton's story was true and he did see two men driving Paul Fugit away from Faraway Ranch, they would have been headed that direction. On top of that, David had been living in Tucson in early 1980, working at an auto shop owned by a Frank Youngfist. When Craig Emanuel went to talk to David, he said that he was just, you know, he was just telling tales. He was just trying to make himself sound cool at a party. But just to clear his name for good, he agreed that he would come to Tucson at the, at the Cochise County Sheriff Department's expense, and he would have a conversation on polygraph to put it all out there to clear his name. Now, since polygraphs are coming up a lot in this video, I should mention that they are horribly inaccurate. Like, they're not admissible in court, they are used solely as an investigative tool. Or at least, today, a polygraph would only be used as an investigative tool. There have been points in certain states in the country where polygraph results have in fact been produced to the court. They're not considered reliable today. It didn't matter though, because David was so nervous about the polygraph that he took too many sleeping pills the night before and went in, failed it, basically it said he lied, and he said, oh, well, I'm sorry, I was on sleeping pills. So the polygraph results were kind of thrown out. He also told Detective Emanuel that so many people were accusing him of doing it that he sometimes wondered if he had. With David's testimony essentially being useless, Emanuel went to the next best thing in David's case, which would have been Frank Youngfist. When he arrived at Auto World, Frank Youngfist greeted him by asking how Doty was doing and saying, missing persons cases sure are hard, huh? After that, Burrell reports that the interview became rather hostile and Emanuel was kicked out. Emanuel then went to the county and tried to get all of Youngfist's records, arrests, things like that, and unfortunately he was unable to because Youngfist was able to pull some strings and get the assistant DA to say no. This sent Emanuel's suspicions into overdrive, especially once he found out that Youngfist really had a good time taking his private plane down to Mexico. All the time. But when Burrell spoke to uh, Youngfist's kids, his daughter said that their dad liked to go down to Mexico to go fishing, and one of his sons said that my dad was just an asshole. As far as Emanuel was concerned, both Youngfist and David knew a little bit too much for people who weren't directly involved, but on the other hand, word travels fast, so it's possible they could have heard the details of the case just out and about. That meant that there was no smoking gun, even though there was enough circumstantial evidence to make someone curious. The only solid connection he could dig up to David possibly being in the area at the time things happened was that David possessed a dune buggy that he and a friend would often take out into the desert, and that that friend's father, who was a business partner of Frank Youngfist, owned a 40-acre property. That 40-acre property had been purchased a month after Paul had disappeared, over market price, and then sold two years later. However, nobody could or would say that David had ever actually been to that property. The following year, Emanuel recorded that Doty had told him that Paul and four other employees of the park had gone to Mexico to buy marijuana, but Bonnie, as well as a parks employee who allegedly was in that car with Paul, said that they just went down there for, or well, actually, Bonnie said that they probably went down to pick up peppers and fresh tortillas for a weekly pepper feast that they had, which I will admit does sound like BS, but the other guy in the car said that the whole thing was baseless. As, as random as Pepper Feast sounds, it actually sounds specific enough to be legit. And according to Bonnie, this is something they did weekly and nobody ever contradicted that, so... And then in 1984, another letter came out, this time addressed to the Department of the Interior, not Emanuel and not the National Park Service. And it read, 
Gentlemen, are you still seeking the whereabouts of the National Park Ranger who disappeared from the Chiricahua National Monument in January of 1980? If so, Tex Carpenter, an inmate in the Arizona State Prisons, is who you should talk to, as he told me nearly a year ago that he helped knock off and get rid of a park ranger who got in his partner's way while they were doing something illegal with narcotics in the, uh, in the aforementioned park. There is more to the letter, but that's all that Burrell shared, and I don't have a copy of the full thing. But what's noted about the letter is not necessarily that it was also sent from Illinois, nor that it was addressed to the Department of the Interior, although both of those are relevant details, but what really caught Burrell's eye, and what caught my eye as well, was the fact that the salutation gentleman was not ended with a comma nor a colon, but a semicolon. That's unusual, because the two ways to end a salutation are a colon or a comma. Very few people would choose to use a semicolon. They did actually try to figure out who had sent this letter, which was just block printed. It wasn't, it wasn't handwritten or typed. They tried to figure out who sent the letter, and the closest person they could find was a former cellmate of Carpenter's who had been extradited to Illinois. However, when they went and interviewed him, he said, I didn't write it, and if I had, I would have helped you. And from there, the trail just went completely cold. Youngfist, Goff, and Carpenter are all dead now, and the man referred to as David is living somewhere else under an assumed name, not speaking to anybody about the case, even Burrell. As for why he's living in a different place under an assumed name, well, somebody leaked his name to the media back in the 80s, and everybody assumed he had actually done it, so he had to go into hiding. Burrell says that the auto shop he owns and operates now doesn't even have a mail slot. Not much happened over the course of the next four years, until 1989, when Dodie in fact won her case, entitling her to $40,000 in back pay, as well as a monthly stipend. This was to be paid by the National Park Service, who to this day still consider Paul not dead, but missing, which is of course the central issue of this episode. What happened to Paul? Theories abound, ranging from the classics like alien abduction or skinwalker attack, to something more conspiratorial, like that the National Park Service took him out, or that he simply walked off the job. Now, at the beginning of this video, I did tell you that nobody has suggested that he was abducted by aliens, and that's true, in the sense that nobody has ever seriously tried to claim that, beyond, oh, maybe the aliens got him. There's been no reports of weird lights and strange sounds and objects and little gray men. It's just people being like, ah, well, I mean, maybe he was abducted. I did see some people suggesting in comment sections in places like Reddit that maybe a skinwalker got to him, and for what is arguably the first time, that's actually not an unreasonable suggestion, considering that skinwalkers come from Navajo culture, and the Navajo and the Apache are very closely related, and the Navajo nation and reservation is not far north of Chiricahua. And if you look at what skinwalkers actually are, rather than what TikTok thinks skinwalkers are, the realistic skinwalkers are Navajo witches who commit some pretty heinous acts. We've gone over this. We have a whole video on what skinwalkers are. We actually have several videos on what skinwalkers are, but uh, just to give you the, the cliff notes of the idea right now, uh, it is a medicine man who practices bad medicine, aka dark magic as we would know it from a European context, and in order to gain the powers they have to transform into animals, they have to commit a heinous act against somebody who trusts them and somebody who they love. Typically, this manifests as murdering a family member. From there, they are said to be able to gain the spiritual or physical powers of various animals by wearing their skins. Again, this depends on who you talk to, which specific legend you look at, but that's the general gist of things. So, practicing skinwalkers do exist. Whether or not you want to believe that they can physically transform into a coyote is up to you. From there, we can factor in the part where Paul actually did work at the Navajo National Monument on Navajo Nation territory. So, like I said, as far as every missing persons case we've looked at goes, this is one of the few where skinwalker attack is actually possible. But even if it was a skinwalker attack, that would still be the same kind of thing as foul play. And this isn't one of those times, like with most missing 4 on one cases, where there's nothing to take you to foul play. In this one, we have a number of leads, a number of suspects, and some possibilities of intentional disappearance. 
Beginning with Goff and Carpenter, the former just outright refused to be involved, said that he had nothing to do with it and he wouldn't speak to police about it, whereas Carpenter waffled for a few hours and then said he wouldn't take a polygraph, then said he would take a polygraph, and then recanted his whole story. But prior to recanting, Carpenter's story was that he had seen Goff, who was 25, and another unnamed man shoot and kill Fugit. Then, Carpenter helped bury that man in a wash south of Tucson in Santa Cruz County. We also have David's claims, which match up pretty well with Carpenter's story of a murder most foul, but his version doesn't involve any accomplices. And he didn't point the finger at either Carpenter or Goff. That said, David did seem to know enough details to make Detective Emanuel suspicious, and Youngfist's weird behavior and then pulling strings to make sure that nobody could get a hold of his records really put a microscope on this. Really put it under a microscope. I hate turns of phrase. Now, theoretically, David could be that unnamed third man that Carpenter referenced, but I found nothing to connect David to the other two men, and when we consider Horton's story, it causes more problems. Long before any information about Goff, Carpenter, or David had come to light, Dick Horton told investigators that he had seen two men driving away with Paul Fugit in a green pickup truck with a camping shell. Under hypnosis, he told Emanuel that Paul had looked sad and dejected, and that the two men he was with, one had a beard, a plaid shirt, the other was wearing a green jacket, and the driver appeared to be in his 30s. Now, James Carpenter was 41, and Ernest Goff was 25. Baby-faced and older-looking people notwithstanding, that's the wrong number of people to match Carpenter's story. That doesn't necessarily rule Carpenter, Goff, or David out, but it does leave enough questions to look at the other possibilities. Pat Hanley's theory was that Paul had simply walked off the job to escape a life that was crumbling and a career that was going nowhere, and he's really not crazy to do so. Still, he faced a significant amount of backlash, not only from Craig Emanuel, but also from other park's employees. For example, in 1984, a colleague of Paul's at the park by the name of Bill Murray told investigators that Hanley did not listen to information given by colleagues who knew Paul and the ins and outs of operations. This inattentiveness was relevant to two primary issues, those being Paul's marriage and Paul's day-to-day -day activities in the park. Hanley pointed out that Paul had left behind his keys, which he would need to access any property on the park, and therefore he had not set off on a routine hike. Murray said that it was perfectly normal for Paul to not bring along his keys, because Paul actually had two sets of keys, his personal ones, and a set of master keys for every single property on the property, on the grounds. According to Murray, he only really ever carried that master key set when he was on duty. Hanley also reported that Paul had complained that his marriage was dying, and back in those days, it was pretty easy to escape a marriage by just going across the border to Mexico. Once again, Murray contradicted him, telling investigators that as far as he could tell, Paul Fugit had no intentions to sever the relationship with his wife. But when Burrell spoke to Murray in 2018, the latter man sang a somewhat different, if not completely opposite, tune. According to Murray's later testimony, Paul seemed like something of a lost soul, and Murray even said that Paul's intellect and passion were wasted on a place like Chiricahua. Essentially, Murray believed that the National Park Service had it out for Paul, and that Paul would never see a post like Yellowstone. Now, that's not marital troubles, but it's also certainly not satisfaction with life. Additionally, Murray could recall a strange incident from just a month earlier in December of 1979 when Paul came over and gifted him an M14 rifle. Murray says for the life of him he can't figure out why that was done, but he never reported it to investigators. There's a couple of possibilities. Paul could have been concerned about safety on the monument grounds and thought that his friend should be well armed, or there's also the fact that Paul had a very prized gun collection and maybe he was gifting that to Bill Murray as a way for the latter man to remember him. Murray also fessed up to embellishing the importance of Paul's marriage to the missing man, as he felt that regardless of where Paul was or what had happened to him, Dodie was getting a raw deal. She'd not only been refused survivor benefits, but ordered to pay back nearly $7,000 that had been paid to Paul because the National Park Service claimed he was just AWOL. Speaking to Burrell, Murray said, I never felt like his relationship with Dodie was an anchor. And that brings us to possibility number three, which it appears was completely ignored in the initial stages of the investigation due to polygraph results and the media framing things. And that possibility is that Dodie was in on it. 
From the beginning, as Burrell wisely notes, there were very few questions asked of Dodie. Most importantly, where was she on January 13th, 1980, and why did it take her four days to arrive? She said that on the day she was informed that Paul was missing, which would have been Monday the 14th of January, she went to see a therapist friend of hers, and then also stuck around waiting to see if somebody would call to ask about a ransom. Additionally, everyone around said that when Dodie arrived, she was very calm and collected given the situation. And Murray said that Dodie seemed more upset about Bonnie's pregnancy than she did about Paul's disappearance. She had written that she was concerned that the Park Service would use Paul's infidelity against him, and also that it is not going to be easy to deal with Bonnie, especially after Hanley got through with her. It's an odd statement, but it's not necessarily criminal. There was more to that, as investigators found two financial documents in Paul's cabin. One was a check written from Dodie to Paul, and the other was an unfinished life insurance application. Her explanations of these facts I find a little bit shaky. As far as the check goes, she claimed that she and Paul had plans for both of them to move into a bunkhouse on the faraway ranch property sometime in June, and that she had sent him the check so that he could go to nearby Wilcox, Arizona, and set up a bank account there. The problem with that is that Hanley tracked down the bank that they were using and found that that bank already had a branch in Wilcox, so sending Paul a check was a completely unnecessary action. Furthermore, Paul had mentioned the plan that he and Dodie would be moving into a bunkhouse on the faraway ranch property to absolutely nobody. In fact, not even Bonnie, who was at the time dating Paul and was planning to come back to the park for work in the next season, was aware of this. You would expect that if there was a plan within six months for them to move residences into an unoccupied bunkhouse that was not actually like hooked up to anything, that somebody would have been told about it at the park. To explain all of this, Dodie told Hanley that the plan was oriented around Paul being able to keep an eye on the sketchy characters that she reported seeing at Faraway Ranch. Now, these are the same sketchy characters doing the vandalism that nobody ever noticed aside from Dodie, and that was never actually found. And that sticks out to me, because if we're talking about drug dealing or illegal immigration, which is what Dodie was implying was going on at the ranch, that wouldn't fall under National Park Service responsibilities. That would be the DEA or Border Patrol. And you would assume that if Paul was planning to move from a cabin to this bunkhouse, he would have informed somebody at the property that it was going to happen within the next six months. Then there's Dodie's polygraph session, in which she was asked if she had spoken to Paul or knew anything about his whereabouts since he'd gone missing. She brought a friend, a tape recorder, and a lawyer to that polygraph session. After she had taken the exam, the polygrapher determined that the results were near the numerical area of being inconclusive on what is already an extremely unreliable type of test. The polygrapher did believe that she was telling the truth, but he also reported that she seemed very subdued, and polygraphs basically test nervousness. They do this by tracking the cardiopulmonary system, perspiration, and electrodermal activity, basically how much electricity the skin will conduct. So simply remaining calm can actually trick a polygraph, and she appeared very calm. Burrell had all of the same questions I have regarding this polygraph test and her whereabouts and these plans to move, so he decided he was just going to go and talk to her, and he did that in 2018 or 2019. And this is not something that she was particularly enthusiastic about. Prior to being contacted by Burrell, and upon hearing that the investigation was being reopened to an extent, Dodie had written an email in which she expressed that she was paranoid after this long. She then went on to write, when I hear an NPS guy talks to a writer and has given him names which I thought were confidential and also had called Bonnie, I became really worried. I personally wonder why somebody who genuinely believes that her husband is dead would be concerned about somebody trying to figure out how it actually happened. Especially considering that if Paul was still alive and she didn't know that, she couldn't be held liable. However, Dodie was pretty open and transparent with Burrell, inviting him back to her home to look through her files. When he did that, he found that she was, as he calls it, in dire financial straits by 1985. She had a salary of just $20,000 a year and only about $2,000 in the bank. She also wrote to her lawyer, Ed Morgan, I believe this was 1985, that the wretches at the National Park Service owed her $660,000 to cover her home, uh, her mental health care, 
her physical health care, and the things she had lost during the time that uh, that Paul was missing and that they were bothering her during all of these uh, proceedings in court. But her letters also contain something else of interest, a semicolon in the salutation, just like the one in the letter sent to the Department of the Interior in August of 1984. This was that second letter from Illinois that said that Tex Carpenter was involved. Burrell asked her point blank if she could have been involved in the disappearance or if she had sent that letter to the Department of the Interior, an idea which she called ludicrous, and he says that this led to him feeling like a jerk because in his files he did have a letter written by Tex Carpenter that began with a semicolon at the end of the salutation. She also told Burrell that she, a former Rifle Team star, had thoughts of taking a sniper rifle that Paul had built for her, going and finding two National Park Service lawyers that she really didn't like and assassinating them, but then that she thought better of it and considered that an unwise plan, so she sold the rifle. Now, if Doty genuinely did believe that Paul died on duty and that the National Park Service was giving her the runaround and denying her benefits that she was actually owed, I can't necessarily call that crazy. I I'd call it drastic, but I wouldn't call it crazy. However, the question is, did she genuinely believe that? There are a few things that stand out to me. For example, I am more skeptical about how bad her financial situation was than Burrell is, and I think it might be well worth noting that Burrell went to college in and lives in California, where it is extremely expensive to live. I say that because $20,000 a year back in 1980 was a very, very, very livable $57,000 a year. And that $2,000 in savings is today $5,700. In a place like Los Angeles, $57,000 a year puts you near the poverty line, but in a place like rural Arizona, that is plenty of money. Burrell also came across a letter and a handwritten will from December 1978, both uh, allegedly written by Paul. And it's important to note that December of 1978 is exactly nine months after Paul met Bonnie. The letter and will were both of the same nature, you know, something might happen to me, and if it does, I want you to be self-sufficient. I've done my best to set everything up for you, you know, I think that you are capable, but most importantly here, I think it's, we, we should note that Paul was writing this because he felt that for some reason soon, he may not be around anymore. But the point is that he said, sell some of my guns, bury me for cheap, and the best way to get the payout for my death is uh, for the purpose of paying out a loan. In my opinion, that's the kind of letter you write when you are genuinely concerned that something is going to happen to you. You're either aware that you are in danger, or you're considering ending it all yourself. As for the Tex Carpenter letter that has the semicolon in it, the one from 1984, I did some thinking about that as well, and I agree with Burrell's uh, assessment that it sounds like something out of an Elmore Leonard novel. It really does come across as something that Doc Holliday would say. I'm your huckleberry. Now, Elmore Leonard did not write Tombstone, but he did have an outsized influence on the Western genre from the 1950s onward. Additionally, the letter was postmarked Illinois, but Tex Carpenter was in Arizona, so it doesn't matter that Tex Carpenter had once written a letter with a semicolon in the salutation. It only matters that we know Doty had a habit of doing that. And that's not all that Burrell caught either, and as a result of everything he put into this, I am very impressed with his work. You see, when he walked into Doty's home, there was a set of clothes, a shirt and pants, sitting on a chair, and Doty told him she didn't even know how long they'd been there. She told him that they were Paul's civilian clothes, specifically the ones that he would have put on if he'd come home that night of January 13th, 1980. The problem is that the shirt was not only a work shirt, not a leisure shirt, like a work shirt as in the style of button down two pockets right here, uh, but also it was from a brand that didn't exist until 1987. Along with that, how could Doty in Tucson possibly know what Paul in Chiricahua was planning to wear when he got home that evening. And that's not even addressing the fact that it seems very unlikely that Paul was the type to pick out his clothes ahead of time, although it is possible that Bonnie had picked out the outfit for him and it was her who told Doty. That or he was oddly organized about one very specific thing. When Burrell eventually pointed out that the shirt was far too new to have been Paul's, Doty simply said that it was a simple mix-up and, you know, it must have been her shirt, but I don't necessarily buy that because 
she must have purchased that shirt long after Paul disappeared, and she was, like, she was being very nostalgic and sentimental about this was his last set of clothes. And I don't, I don't mean to mock a, a widow, I just, it's a weird, that, that's a weird thing. That's not a, that's not like a normal mix-up. But yeah, there's a little bit more to it, which is that the National Park Service investigator assigned to this case in 2017, Clay Anderson, who, with whom Burrell worked very closely from 2017 until 2021, told him about a sighting that was possibly Paul, 35 miles from the Mexican border. Sometime after Paul's disappearance, a former colleague of his who had gone through training with him reported that while he was sitting at a bar in Sierra Vista, Arizona, a man who looked exactly like Paul walked in, sat down, and ordered a drink. The lookalike took a few sips of his drink and then made eye contact with Paul's former colleague, at which point the colleague reported that there was a moment of recognition at which point Paul immediately grabbed his bag, got up, left his half-finished drink on the table, and left. The former colleague, thinking on his feet, acquired the cup that Paul had been drinking from, put it into a plastic bag, and brought it to the investigators. They tested it for fingerprints, got fingerprints off the cup, and ran them against the database, only to find that Paul, who is a National Park Service employee for eight years, keep in mind the National Park Service is technically law enforcement, employee for eight years, they did not have his fingerprints. As I mentioned earlier, Burrell did not share everything he knows in this article, which, as I said, is understandable in the journalism field. However, amongst the litany of small clarifying questions I have is one that might not be super important, but I'm still curious about the answer. In 2017, Clay Anderson was tasked with digging up the cold, dead, buried Paul Fugit case that had been untouched, essentially, since 1989, based on a new lead that they determined went nowhere. The problem is that the National Park Service nor Burrell will say what it was, at least not directly, but I think that Burrell may have given it away via his context. Burrell mentions that Emanuel had a suspect, he firmly believed David was responsible, and that Anderson wanted to get cadaver dogs onto a property in Arizona. We also know that David's friend's father, a partner of Frank Youngqvist, owned property in Arizona and sold it two years after purchasing it. That leads me to believe that for some reason, they suspected that Paul's body may be on that property and that David may in fact have done it. But again, it went nowhere and it doesn't tell us much. If, if a body had been found, it would have told us quite a bit, but obviously not. Either way, it doesn't necessarily exonerate or indict David. It's just an interesting little tidbit that I'm curious to know. But this leaves us with five possibilities. First off, Carpenter's story is entirely plausible if lacking in concrete evidence. He and Goff were known criminals, he told a fairly detailed story, and there were three letters implicating him or Goff. On the other hand, his story doesn't really match with Dick Hortons, who said that there were only two men with Paul, as well as the fact that no shell casings were found when he said that somebody was shot, and there was essentially no reason for Carpenter and Goff to be at Faraway Ranch at all. All of their criminal activity that I could find was centered around Tucson, and Faraway Ranch is two hours away. Furthermore, the letters couldn't be traced to any specific individual, and Dodie Fugit may have written one of them. By the same token, Paul could have been killed by somebody else. It could have been a drug deal gone wrong, he could have run across some traffickers, or he could have simply been in the wrong place at the wrong time. For example, Frank Youngfist was very odd about the case, often flew his private plane to Mexico, and just because the body was not on that land does not mean the body was never on that land or that Youngfist didn't do it. It was suggested by investigators, specifically DEA agent Brian Myers, that the main reason you might fly a private plane to Mexico frequently is to pick up marijuana. It could be that when Paul was living in Tucson, he was buying weed from Frank Youngfist's people, kept doing so when he moved to the monument, and then he got on the dealer's bad side somehow. After all, Dick Horton did say he saw Paul with two men, and those two men could have been David and his friend playing Enforcer. However, he was in Tucson every other weekend, so why did Young Fist need to come to him? The only thing I can think of is that they thought it would be safer and essentially harder to trace them if they went to the monument to do it. That way they could avoid suspicion, then they may have also bought that property to throw the investigators off, basically give them a, a nice, you know, glistening, glimmering lead, only for them to look at it and be like, ah, well, that's not it. And, considering that Youngquist owned an auto shop, they did have access to a lot of cars. However, I do recognize that there's a lot of assumptions involved there. 
It also could be that Dodie was in on things and that she and Paul had planned all of this out. I'm not gonna say that she was caught in any straight lies, but her story does not add up in a number of ways. Specifically, the shirt, the affidavit signed by Bill Murray, her late arrival to the search, and her perfectly calm demeanor. The shirt can't possibly have been Paul's because the brand didn't exist until seven years after he died. Bill Murray did tell Burrell that he had essentially exaggerated how important Paul's marriage was to help uh, Dodie out back in the 80s. She was four days late to the search for no real reason because even if she did stick around for one day to see if there would be a ransom call, that doesn't explain where she was the next two. And according to Burrell, she had like 10 civil legal advisors assisting her, so she likely would have known, going into the polygraph, that she could ace it by just remaining calm. And then we add into it that Bonnie left immediately at Dodie's urging, and that Dodie herself admitted to being nervous when she found out that Burrell was poking around and had spoken to Bonnie. Perhaps she and Paul recognized that their marriage was dying and organized this whole thing as a way that they could both benefit from Paul's disappearance. This would explain Dodie pulling out all of the stops when Burrell came to visit in order to convince him that she was still grieving. This would explain the impossible shirt mix-up and one should question the seemingly fabricated story that she intended to move to the park. However, Dodie could also just be traumatized by the entire thing and deeply worried that the National Park Service will come knocking asking for the money they gave her after 1989. Then we have the possibility that Paul really did just up and leave without telling anybody, even Dodie or Bonnie, so that he could get out of the marriage and start life over, you know, in the country 30 minutes south of him. The country he was known to visit, weekly. He did allegedly write out that will and letter to Dodie telling her how to handle his death financially. There was an unfinished life insurance application in his cabin, and Bill Murray said that Paul had just seemed generally dissatisfied with life. Dodie also shared with Burrell that they had ceased intimacy five years into the marriage due to medical issues on her side that made things painful. That is what explains the open marriage. That's why they had an open marriage. One problem here is that he also didn't tell his girlfriend, who is who you would assume that he would start his new life with, but at the same time, he also lied and told her he got a vasectomy. I should include the possibility that the vasectomy did happen and that it did reverse itself, uh, but vasectomies have a 99.85% efficiency rate, success rate, and Dodie had no recollection of the man ever getting a vasectomy. And then of course there is the sighting in Sierra Vista. If Paul had simply disappeared on his own, by choice, I mean he could have come back to Arizona for some reason or another. Finally, and perhaps most conspiratorially, there is the possibility that it was the National Park Service or members of the National Park Service who took Paul out themselves. The parks didn't like him and Murray had told Burrell Paul wasn't going anywhere in the Park Service. They had it out for him. Basically, the allegation here would be that they stationed him at Chiricahua hoping that he would just quit on his own, got impatient when he didn't, and just offed him themselves. They sure fought real hard not to pay his widow any money, and from the get-go, the overall National Park Service seemed pretty disinterested in trying to find Paul at all. Pat Hanley writing it off as a purposeful disappearance, and the Park Service leaving Cochise County and the park employees at Chiricahua to do the work themselves. They'd also have the resources to send letters that would be postmarked from Illinois accusing Goff and Carpenter, and Goff and Carpenter loosely match the description given by Horton. They'd also been arrested just weeks after Paul's disappearance, after they had stolen a pickup truck and crashed it into an orange tree. It does sound far-fetched until you consider what the ATF did at Ruby Ridge, or what the FBI did to MLK, or what the CDC did at Tuskegee, or what the ATF and the FBI did at Waco. You know, we, we could go on, but I think you get the point. Also after that, it starts to be agencies with longer names that aren't three letters, and it just kinda, it ruins the bit. I only really consider this a possibility because of the letter and will written in 1978, which really seemed like they came from a man who felt that he was in imminent danger. And the stories that were given by David and by Carpenter are just too random to match that. In either of the cases that they'd have been involved with, there's no reason why Paul would have been looking over his shoulder. But if the National Park Service was responsible in some way, you could understand why Paul might be paranoid. Still, murdering him seems like a bit much for the National Park Service, especially considering that they had already stuck him in this remote, seldom visited corner of Arizona to waste away in the sun. And what is so deeply frustrating about this case is that that's just where it ends. There's no hidden stuff here, there's nothing I was able to come across. I I'm just at a loss for what could have happened here. 
every single possibility seems just as likely as any of the others. At the end of the day, it's clear that one of two things happened, though, because Paul is nowhere on that monument. Either Paul left of his own free will, something that Dodie could have been aware of or not been aware of, or Paul was murdered. The question in both of those instances is who actually knew something about it, who was hiding something, who was lying. If it was Dodie Fugit and she did know something about it and she has been covering it up all of these years, then the only victim is the American taxpayer. If it really was Carpenter and his crew, well, then who really knows what happened? We don't know who the third man is and we never will. But there was no reason for them to be out there and they had no affiliation with narcotics that I could track down. And it's that letter that involves narcotics that seems like it could have been sent by Dodie Fugit that makes me wonder if she was somehow involved. But at the same time, she could have just been so grief-stricken, so traumatized by the entire situation, that she was willing to do anything to get the government to look into it. The National Park Service angle is really drastic for the National Park Service because it involves a government agency deciding that this guy is, or at least people working for a government agency, deciding this guy who has done nothing wrong aside from wear his haircut the wrong way and then sue when he was fired wrongfully, that's just not a good enough motive to murder somebody, especially because you could eventually get caught. But it would be a reason that Paul would be paranoid and they would be the people who have the most resources to carry that out. And the final one I want to just kind of go over really quick is the David case because I think that one's the most likely option. I think that if Youngfist was dealing drugs, then it's entirely plausible that David was working for him. David did tell a bunch of people at a party in Wisconsin that he had murdered somebody where Cochise is buried in southeastern Arizona. I uh, and David would match the description well enough. I don't have a picture of the guy, so I don't know if he ever had a Kenny Loggins beard, but it makes the most sense to me that Paul had done something to piss off Young Fist. Young Fist dispatched these two guys out there to take care of him, whether that meant beating him up or just straight up killing him, because clearly David did not have good judgment. They did know he'd be at the monument. They did know that they wouldn't be suspects because they were in Tucson. It just, it's the one where the most things add up. I will say that in the year 2024, this case is probably solved overnight. You know, there's traffic cameras, there's drones, there's all sorts of technology that we can use to look for something like this, look for evidence. It's a lot harder to hide financial transactions. You know, there's, there's a lot of ways in 2024 that you wouldn't get away with this that you could in 1980. So, in my opinion, I, I can't really say that I have a, a strong feeling about any possibility, but I do think that if anyone is responsible, it's most likely David, uh, or Paul really did just decide to up and leave. But I, I really, I just don't, I don't see Paul up and leaving of his own volition. That, I, maybe if Dodie's in on it, but I don't see him just doing that on his own. But, of course, we always want to hear from you guys. We want to know what you think about our conclusions, what you think about our presentation, if there's anything you think that we missed, or any input you might have. Maybe you actually know somebody involved with the case. So, if you know any of that, please leave us a comment. Or, you know, if you want to leave a comment just to help the algorithm, go for it. That would be appreciated. Also, if you want to support what we're doing here at the Lore Lodge, you can subscribe to our Patreon for just $1 a month. There are higher tiers, but $1 a month will support our channel and everything that we do, and we really do appreciate it. You can also become a member here on YouTube for $5 a month. And if you want to support us in other ways, we have a coffee through Tableau Roasting Company. You can get that through the link in the description. We also have a Discord where you can get all of our, uh, our wonderful updates and be part of the Lore Lodge community. You can also check out our merch uh, in the, the store panel just below the video. Or we have a deal coming soon with a new company that we will be bringing to you for all sorts of new cool designs. You can also catch discussions about these topics or just general Lore Lodge interests Sunday nights at 7 p.m. Eastern Time. And if you can't make it to the live show, they're always video on demand here on YouTube and accessible via Spotify, uh, Google Playlists, Apple Podcasts, all of that stuff. We also have several other channels which we are working on getting more content for. The Weird Bible will be getting new content the soonest. That is coming up in February. We also have the History Hut, the Lore Lounge, and we are going to be starting a channel for short films and things like that. Also presently, if you want more of me specifically, you can get that on my personal channel, Aiden Mattis, where I stream Tuesday, Thursday, and Friday nights. With all of that said, I am Aiden Mattis, and thank you for stopping by the Lore Lodge.